For our listeners, uh, good afternoon, Alex. My name is Claudia. I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Alex Calier accepted our invitation to the show. Alex, welcome to the show, man. Uh, hi, welcome. Yeah, to, thanks for having me, actually. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Alex, let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like, in, a, in a musical family? And how old were you when you perhaps began taking, you know, piano lessons, guitar lessons? Oh, I I was uh, born... In, in, in the, well, my dad was very much into music, but he was a doctor. Uh, yeah. His his dream was to be a musician, but he was never a musician. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, when he was in, in in at university, he was like part of a jazz club, and so they organized uh, jazz gigs and concerts, and and so he was always playing music around the house. Uh, he was very eclectic in his taste, uh, not only jazz but also classical music, pop music. Uh, actually, completely different than his brothers. He had like four brothers and. The other brothers only listen to Bach, and that's it. It's Bach, Bach, maybe a little Mozart, and then yeah. But my but my dad was very much into um, into to all kinds of music, and so when I was I think eight, I was got interested in playing music. Uh, I was a friend of mine at school one went to to the music local music school, and I wanted to join him. And my parents said, "Yeah, why not? You know, the only th the only rule in our at our house was that if you started something, you had to finish it." So, I started when I was eight. Started playing when uh, piano when I was nine, and then by the time I was ten, I actually started writing my first piano pieces on piano. And I was very lucky to have a very well, a very cool piano teacher. He was quite young at that time, but he was very much into uh, looking. For the right kind of pieces of music for me to play because immediately he kind of like I, I was never very very fond of classical harmony you know like so yeah so 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 mozart and haydn and all that stuff it was it wasn't really my cup of tea and so he was looking for stuff that would kind of like um keep me interested and so one day he got me into uh eric satie you know the gymnopedies of eric satie and that was something that kind of suddenly it struck me that I I like that kind of harmony way more, you know. Like um, so, the impressionists in classical music that was my kind of thing. And so by the time I was twelve, I did I I was like uh, participating in a uh, a writing concours, you know, like a writing, uh, and then I wrote like a four hands handed piece of piano, and the jury didn't. Uh, thought I was cheating. They said it's not possible that you wrote it, so I didn't win. <laughs> really? So, um, wow. Yeah, really. So, but then, then after five years, when I was thirteen, or I, I, I got into electric guitar, and I was like, you know, listening a lot to pop music by that time. Of course, I was the youngest of three, so my I uh, I was the youngest of three boys, and so my brother had a friend who had an older brother so he brought like records to my brother so i listened to what my brother was listening to and him so i was like when i was in when i was 12 years old i was listening to the simple minds and depeche mode and all that kind of stuff because yeah. i of course had the influence of an older brother um and so by the time i was 15 i started my first band that was actually uh uh like very poppy kind of naive kind of thing but it was it was cool you know like we we did a couple of gigs and and by the time i was 17 i no, when i was actually in the studio with that first band that was the first time i ever when i, I was in a in a recording studio and i was 15 and it was a demo studio it wasn't a great studio but immediately i kind of realized that you know recording music is also a language like any other language and i had difficulties communicating with the engineer i didn't i wanted something a bit more etheric or a bit more kind of dreamy and and so i when i by the time i was 16 i knew i wanted to become a sound engineer um slash musician slash producer slash you know like i was actually quite quite uh yeah quite avant-garde i was like you know like i i already Kind of as if I've already felt that in the future, because now we're talking about I think eighty eight, ninety eighty eight. But I was, it felt for me that the future 
it would be important that as a musician you would be able to kind of record yourself and mix yourself and produce yourself and so i went to film school actually in brussels when i was 17 really young i was the youngest in in the whole school i was young i was living in brussels on my own and there i met frank duchenne our first keyboard player uh and actually in life, it's quite interesting to see that although I wanted to become a sound engineer in Belgium at that time, around 1990, there was not really like a sound engineering school. There was not like in the States, you didn't have Berkeley or you didn't have that kind of stuff. So I, I was yeah. obliged to go to film school and do everything like uh, camera work, uh, video editing, film editing and sounds and and also soundscaping. I had a very good teacher who got me into soundscaping and got me into making soundtracks with noise, just daily noise. And actually, that was what inspired us. That was what inspired that first Hoover, Hoover record, or Hoover Phonic record. It was kind of like we got the idea, like, what if we combine these kind of weird kind of stuff from La Musique Concrete was like a movement in the 60s in France with Pierre Henri was one of the big kind of like composers. And we really liked what he did because he had this one track that they played at the local indie disco. Every week they played it. Mm. And it's um, it's it's just a combination. He wrote it for Maurice Bejar for like a ballet or something. And so it's a combination of a rock band and his kind of weird kind of stuff and sounds and weird soundscapes and that it was actually the start of hoover phonic kind of like we we got a sampler and we got a, an atari 1040 st we got like a wow. juno 106 a couple of things you know like and we started making these demos uh, and we and the cool thing was because we were young and we both me and frank both went to film school we were able to do everything ourselves you know we could record we could mix the demos we we were even like the first shows we were even programming the light show we we had the computer like running along for the sample so we thought like well then at, then probably we can like have the light show also like you know time locked with with the beats and so we programmed the whole show and uh and that's that's how we started so it's kind of uh we were we were really young actually that was uh, when it all started yeah and then but what about so if you were that inclined in music why you didn't apply to like equivalent of the berkeley here right or juilliard school like a music school did it have uh, yeah because have the, or no? or? yeah we, we we had that but i wasn't really well back in the days it was only for classical music or jazz so uh, it, I got it, pop, right. it was it, it, it didn't exist for pop music so that was for me was a problem you could do it in london but that was too expensive for my parents they couldn't afford it so but in the end i i also wanted to be free i didn't want to kind of learn all these har harmony tricks and stuff i wanted to kind of follow my gut feeling and it was like almost it's almost like you know if you want to become a director a movie director it's better to learn to learn camera work or to learn how to edit yourself to to do that because then it's going to be easier to talk to your crew because you know how it works and you can communicate Earth, it's yeah. like again about it's again it's like a language and pop music and pop mu music mainly is also a lot of production it's a lot of a lot of treatment of sound so i i was really intrigued by that and i thought like writing songs i can already write songs i can play piano i can play guitar so i don't need to learn that i need to learn how i can produce it how i can record it how i can make it sound interesting got it yeah perfect no it's that's a but that's a very valid answer so we are talking now about 1995 with who funny was for yeah at the beginning you guys were labeled you know like a trip hop group but it, you know eventually you know you were you guys evolved more than a singular genre, right? Uh, yeah. Using alternative electronica, electric pop, a mixture of other. And you were evolving yeah. with the band member. Okay, we, let's try that. Let's try that. And uh, it worked yeah, very we, well, you know? 
we were very eclectic uh that's for sure even our first record you know you had definitely trip hop influences on the first record but if yep. you listen carefully to the first record you also hear shoegaze influences there's a lot of slow dive in my bloody valentine influences there's influences yeah. from the cock bands like the cocteau twins so that's that's a lot of new wave influences actually yeah. uh and that combined with trip hop and a little bit of all kind of different things and we always like this kind of like mix between things that if you would write them down as a recipe, you think this will never work. But then if you hear them, you think like, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. So we were always interested in everything that was that seemed impossible or seemed not interesting and then try to make it interesting. Um, and we changed that. Yeah. I think, you know, like I said, we started as like a soundscape slash pop band and and we evolved more to a soundtrack slash pop band you kind of the, the soundscaping in the beginning was it ve was very abstract it was very kind of a, like the, the first record was more like a david lynch kind of movie and then through the mm -hmm. years the movies changed you know we wrote soundtracks to movies that didn't exist and so sometimes they were a bit more romantic sometimes they were a bit more acoustic sometimes they were very electronic sometimes it was a bit more of a uh james bond movie and then other times it was a bit more like an art house movie or something it's kind of like you know we were always inspired by by film i think and we try to make different soundtracks and that's why all these albums are quite different um they 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 evolved but at, at, at in the beginning like i said it was very electronic almost kind of cold kind of like and then it started to become a bit more warm uh then we started using a lot of strings and orchestrations and, and and all that that stuff uh but in the end you know i think it's also very typical belgian to kind of be eclectic uh we we live in a country with a lot of different cultures you know like we have the, the latin culture and the germanic uh, culture um so it's kind of like uh as a kid as well we always listen to all kinds of different kinds of music italian music german music american music english music so we were really like you know inspired by so many different things i think that's quite quite cool in a way kind of like we were always very open-minded let's put it that way yeah absolutely i completely agree with you so now you're going to be touring uh, from june to december romania turkey belgium of course is there in a possibility to come to the United States too? I know it's very expensive for band. You need to pay like a like a visa, which which yeah, is, is very it, very expensive to come here. You know because you here too many bands like your area. You know the of course the Howard Phonic, the London Grammar, the Crane, the Lash, uh, and so on and so forth. You know many of these bands. Kai Sakai, they're very popular in here in the United States. So you guys can do very well and you can, but then again, how you, how you come here, you know, the expense. Right? Well, th that's the problem. Last time we did it was, I think in 2018, we, we did a couple of shows in the States, but it was so expensive. It costed us a fortune. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like you say, you know, like the work permits is like already $11,000. And you didn't even pay a ticket. You didn't even pay a hotel. So we definitely well, want to do it again. But uh, but but we need to find the right agents and the right way to do it. It's kind of like you know. Uh, but it's true. Like last time in LA, it was great. You know, it was a great gig, great people, great audience. Uh, we love to play in the states. We did it a lot back in the days. Um, so if if financially we find a way, uh, we definitely would come come to the states. Uh, with be be yeah, because we're here where I live, uh, Alex, in in Virginia. I'm like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to Washington, D.C., Maryland. So in this area, right, this three estate, every yeah. bank comes this way. And I mean literally yeah. every bank. So I'm able to yeah. see, I don't know, between 50 and 60 shows a year I go. You know, yeah. music, yeah. music is very, very important to me. So I'm able to see a lot yeah. of shows. So every band do very well. But then again, right, how you come here, yeah. you know, that's the yeah. because you guys can do very well here. Yeah, you will need to book. I don't know, 10, 15 or 20 gigs to make it worthwhile, right? Yeah, you... well, yeah, that's that's the thing, you know, that's why I said, like, we need a good, a proper kind of a booking agent to kind of do that, because otherwise it's, uh, like, for three or four shows, it's not, you, you can't do it, it's like, not enough. No, yeah. Right, you don't, right, you, you get out of the plane, you are in the whole $20,000, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Without, that's it. without that's even it. selling a ticket, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, 
uh, you are able the first album 1996 uh called a new uh stereophonic sound uh spectacular with the hits like uh you know two wiki and plus yeah. profound it's uh it's it's a masterpiece man i mean all of a sudden you guys were playing a small place and trying to figure out and then you release an album in 96 you, we're going on almost 40 years now it's it, it is very very good man yeah well it, it was quite weird because most bands like they 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 rehearse a lot in a rehearsal space for years and years and then they make the first record but with us it wasn't like we we just had my living room was a small small kind of like home studio and and it, when we 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 really went from nothing to everything in like in in half a year it was really fast it was almost i think we made the demos in in february march by October, we had seven record companies, international record companies that wanted to sign us. And by wow. uh, by 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 April '96, uh, we were touring Europe. And then in September '97, '97, uh, yeah, we were uh, actually touring the states for seven weeks with Fiona Apple. And it's kind of like I still remember that, you know, like the the. We we first sent a couple of demos to Belgian record labels and they were not interested. And then we met uh, Luc Van Acker, which is like you know he used to be in the Revolting Cox and, and bands like that. And he uh, he was a studio manager back in the back in the days. And he heard the demo and he said like, "Well, man, you have to send it internationally to international labels. It's really too cool to kind of just send it to Belgian labels." So he got us this kind of a and r guide with all the dresses of all the companies and so we 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 sent tapes to english companies american american companies i think 4ad was one of them uh capital records sony records uh yeah and then i still remember i was working as a sound engineer for television back in the days like from 94 till 97 um and I was working in the news studio as a sound engineer, and suddenly I had like this, this, uh, you know, we had like a semaphone, you know, like a beeper, you know, like, and I saw this English number. And the, so I called the number and I said, like, hello. And he says, like, yeah, this is Jason Reck. I'm from Sony Music uh, UK. I really like your demo. And we started talking. He said, like, do you guys play live? And um, he, and I was like very kind of like, you know, young and very kind of like arrogant. And I said, like, sure, we play next month. And then when he hung up, I had to call the band and say, like, I promised some guy we will play a gig next month. And we never played. We never had any <laughs> gigs. We, did, yeah. we didn't even we didn't even have we had a rehearsal space. So in a month we had to kind of like figure out how to do it. And then one month later, you had all these labels coming over to Belgium to see uh See, see us play live Ooh. and then actually basically what what kind of did it was it was a guy from emi publishing and he wanted to sign us as well and i was we didn't even know what publishing was we were like publishing publishing what what, what, what is that all about and he explained it a little and he said like for instance i think this track to wiki would be great in a bertolucci movie stealing beauty i'm gonna send it to to them and let's see what happens and we were laughing because you know like we're, we're we're belgians we're very kind of down to words very we were like sure whatever bernardo bertolucci will say yes to a belgian song that is not even recorded and uh one week later he called us and said like yeah you're on the soundtrack you're the opening track of the soundtrack of, of the album uh we have one problem you need to record it as fast as possible because we <laughs> we only had the demo and then at that point also our singer left so so we had to find a new singer so it was quite 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 hectic but so so for, it was really like it went really fast it was like a roller coaster ride it was like like we didn't know what was happening it was like what what, what are we doing suddenly we were like playing in london on mtv live you know like uh, i still oh. remember still remember that i was a sound engineer for belgian television like i said and i could i could kind of organize my schedule quite easy but at some point it became so busy with the band that i i had to i had to go to to play in london for mtv but i had no no holiday left i couldn't couldn't get a free day off not a day off 
So that's the only time in my whole life that I that I asked my dad to write me a note to say that I was ill, you know. And then I went to London, I played a gig. And the next day I came in the newsroom again. And everybody said like, hey, that was great yesterday. Live on, on MTV, we saw you. And we were, I was like, no, 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 I was ill. I was back home. No, that was recorded. No, man, it's, it's live. You know, it was like, so that was the time when I realized like, okay, maybe I have to become like a professional musician. I have to quit my job. So, yeah, so I quit yeah. my job. And my mom said like, no, you're not going to quit, you quit your job. It's a good job and it pays well and it's security. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to travel the world, mom. I'm going to I'm gonna become a, a, a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Uh, the, uh, in that album was um, hard for me to pronounce. Uh, Lygie Sadonius, right? Uh, Lygie Lisha, Sadonius, yeah. Lige, she yeah, was Lige. actually... It was, it's kind of like we we did the demos with uh, with with a young singer called Esther. She left when we were when we were we were supposed to sign a deal with Sony and and that, that same morning she called that she wouldn't do it. And so we that was December and in February Alicia joined us and she was actually the daughter of a colleague of a friend of mine. So it was really like it was just luck you know how what are the odds that a friend of yours is working mm. with somebody whose daughter is a good singer it was like i i still i still can't believe it it happened yeah. you know and then we yeah. then we recorded we recorded that uh version mixed it ourselves and that was the uh movie version and then we did it again with roland harrington for the album in london we went to london to mix um the, the album with roland harrington and i still remember we we were like you know I was I was still learning how to program music, and so when we finished the record with Roland, he said, "Hey Alex, when you guys walked in with the tapes, you know, like with the multi tracks, I thought like, well, let's get in a professional programmer or something like because we have to work on it." And then, but we didn't do that. And after. We finished mixing the album. He said to me, "I'm very happy that I didn't do that because there's something about the programming that is kind of naive that makes it very special and very different, you know. Like, and and so that was one of the coolest compliments I've ever had from from a sound engineer." Yeah, that's good for you. There is a track there in the album because I was uh, as I was preparing question for the. I listen. I have all your music, so I listen to all yeah. your. Stuff. In the last three days, and there is a track that I really like, uh, and, and you don't play that light that often because you have so many to choose from. But uh, uh, plus profan, yeah, 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 yeah. I really yeah. like very a bit. I really like that, uh, and I there's I there's actually look at YouTube to see if there is a live does that, version of that. We, no. We we what we used to play it live, but there's actually the 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 story behind that track is there. There's actually yeah. two versions two versions of the song, and the one is completely different than the other. Uh, the original version was done with a sample from a John Barry soundtrack for James Bond's movie, um, and we didn't get permission for the sample. We cleared. We wanted to clear the sample, and we didn't get permission. And so during the recording of the album after the album was actually already mixed we had to redo pre profond we mixed it ourselves in brussels so so the, the the one that's on the album is actually a version that we had to do because we couldn't cl clear the sample and then afterwards after i think for the 10th anniversary or the 20th anniversary we we tried to clear it again the sample of the original and we got permission and so now you can listen to both so you can find two versions that are completely different and that kind of like uh, both are really cool they're uh, yeah. but they're, they they have nothing to do with them uh, well, one or the other but you know two two wiki became like a milestone i mean you guys like you saying before you you were out of here and then you know in three months five months man you again yeah you know famous yeah. and then you need to yeah start traveling in, in, and start touring and so forth so, so. Yeah, a year a year later we were like playing the Hollywood Hollywood Athletics Club in LA sold out and we were like playing the Roxy sold out in New York and we were like playing the the House of Blues in Orlando sold out and we were like we did we didn't know what was happening. I have to say it was it was it's kind of 
unbelievably mind blowing. Like you know, like as a young twenty three year old guy, suddenly on on tour, it was it was just fantastic. And Gierke was our singer back back. By the time we were we were like touring the states, it was already Gierke who joined us. Uh, yeah, he was the third the third singer. And uh, she was really young. She was like, by the time we got to America, I think she was eighteen. She just got, she just got eighteen. Um, so she wasn't allowed to drink alcohol. She wasn't allowed in some clubs. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I when when my needs became eighteen, you know, my brother has two kids. He has a daughter. Uh, she about now nowadays she's twenty four. But when she got seventeen, I I asked my brother. What 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 would you do if like two guys came to you and say like your daughter is really talented she's a great singer we're gonna take her on the road and we're gonna tour the states with her and and now you know when she's seventeen or eighteen my brother looked at me and said like are you kidding I would never allow it <laughs> I would never <laughs> say yes yeah, said, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have kids but I said like yeah if I would have a daughter I sh I would hesitate I think yeah. Absolutely, yeah, you, yeah. You, we are we're talking about now the second album, Blue Wonder Power Milk, yeah, with the hits like Eden and the Strange yeah. Effect, which yeah. is which is I uh, I think I have here, yeah, I buying a lot of um, Sony music on vinyl and they're releasing a lot of one thousand or two thousand releases, yeah, so they're yeah. Limited and, yeah. Um, of course, um, it another another masterpiece, man. Well, it, that, that, that's a strange one because when it when it when it was got released, actually the album, we we didn't get that great reviews. And after twenty five years, a lot of people think it's one of our best records. So it's kind of sometimes it can be too. I think you can can be too fast with like you know we were already going forward. And we were like going forward in big steps. And so I think for some people, it was a bit too fast. They were like, what is happening? But I have to say, yeah, Eden is like, like my dad died four years ago and Eden was his favorite song. It was, he, he always said like, you know, like that song is so, so it's so perfect in its kind of simplicity. There's not much going on actually. There's like a couple of strings, a couple of horns, and a and a vocal that is very yeah. fragile. And and um, and I still remember we uh, we recorded it in New York this time with Mark Pletty. Uh, Mark Pletty was at that time was a producer, but also a musical director for Bowie, David Bowie. Wow! And um, so uh, we got to New York. And I still remember having an argument about Eden. I wanted it to be programmed the beats. And he said, like, no, 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 we're gonna record it with drums. And and we really like were discussing for hours about it. And I was like, and he said, like, no, we're gonna record it with drums, with live drums. And now I'm very happy that he kind of like convinced me. Because I yeah. think it makes it it makes it even more timeless or something. It makes it yeah. very timeless. It's a very timeless song. And uh, although Mad About You is more popular worldwide, for me, I think Eden is is, is even more beautiful in because it's so yeah. easy. It's almost it's almost like Italian food, you know. There's a couple of ingredients, and there's nothing to mask it, uh, mask any m mistakes. It's so simple, but that that because it's so simple, it needed to be perfect. Um, and so that album was yeah, it was great. We were recording at Looking Glass Studios, which was uh, Philip Glass's studio, his, his his private studio. And Mark Platy knew Philip, and so we we were allowed to, to record there, which was fantastic. Uh, Mark Platy was a, a great musician and a great programmer. So, and then then we we uh, I still remember when we were recording. Uh, Philip Glass. We went to to dinner with him, and then he invited us to a show in Carnegie Hall. Um, and uh, and Lou Reed was sitting behind us, and he was falling asleep all the time <laughs> during during the <laughs> Philip Glass concert. Mm. It was uh, kind of like a cr crazy, cra 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 crazy kind of days. And then we mixed it in Paris. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't always easy to win with me and Mark, you know. But then again, I guess like out of friction, beauty can be can be created or something. Like, look at the best Beatles tracks were not always when 
John and Paul were getting along, you know, like um, so. So it was it was it was very interesting to work with Mark and uh, and like you say, there's a couple of beautiful songs. Magenta is fantastic. I still think it's a beautiful. I still remember I, this week we were playing in Prague. Yeah, this weekend, and I said to the guys, I said like, yeah, when we're playing with a big orchestra again, we need to play Magenta again because it's so beautiful. It's so kind of like you know almost mesmerizing and and uh it was it was great and and we 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 were lucky that that we we could work with with mark with mark Pletty. it was uh just kind of like he kind of took it to the next level i guess um and then we were still touring in the states uh we were touring in europe with moloko and with uh with with massive attack and that was like just being on the road with Massive Attack for us, of course, was like just fantastic. Um, they were really nice guys as well. We were like really, it was, it was, it was just amazing. Uh, and we were playing in the Roseland, Roseland Ballroom and in New York. And uh, we, 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 yeah, there was, um, and, and what the, 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 the funny bit was that. Back in the days, videos were so expensive, you know. Like we spent so much money on on videos. I, th I still remember we were recording the first video for Club Montepulciano, and we recorded it in Paris. That video, and we 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 looked at it and said, like, no, we don't like it. Let's throw it in the bin. We just just threw. It was like fifty thousand dollars. Hepla, here we go. Put it in the bin, and we started again. And then we did Eden with Liz Friedlander in in the states. We recorded that in L.A. in the desert. Like everything was possible. That's what I love about the nineties. You know, like it was like so. The nineties, everything everything was possible. It was like it, there were eclectic times as well. I think if you listen to the charts in in the nineties. You had really commercial stuff, but you also had alternative stuff. Portishead were in the charts. Massive Attack were in the charts. You had like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. I think it was a very interesting time. And I'm I'm very happy and very glad that I was kind of young in the 90s because it gave us a lot of opportunities and a lot of, like I said, financially, we could do whatever, you know, yeah, because yeah. We, we were like back, back in the days. At some point in our career, I think we had like $1 million of debt. And then you know, but we 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 kind of like paid every every euro every every dollar back because we we could sell albums, you know, we could sell records, and and mm. so so because of that, there was also a lot of budget, so you could like you're really like you know do crazy stuff. But then again, you, you know, like great architects always say like there's two interesting budgets, like. Uh, 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 a no budget where there's nothing or like the sky's limit budget that's the two most interesting budgets you know like if you have to be creative with nothing or you can do whatever you think and do it you know like um, and and I kind of believe that nowadays we're we're in my studio here you know like I have my own studio but back in the days that was impossible nowadays with a laptop you can make fantastic records so oh, the, the evolution the the evolution uh it, it, that we 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 went through like uh tech the technology re revolution you should call it was 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 incredible you know uh yeah i i, I kind of like technology i'm the only one in my family the, my brothers are very conservative on that part i'm i'm kind of like i i always like new stuff and new ways to record and new ways to 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 express myself. Absolutely. Was any pressure from Sony, your record label at the time? Oh, the great. Album. Always. Okay, we are selling a hundred thousand vinyl, uh, two hundred thousand. Okay, let's make it to three hundred. You know, we need three hits in the next album. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of pressure, and I have to say it. It it never changed. You know, like uh, still remember on our last album. We did like 15 million plays on a track, which is for very good for 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 a band of our of our generation. And then still, it's never good enough, you know. It's like yeah, but yeah, you know. We uh, I I always said that to record companies. I said like, well, it's never going to be enough anyway. So right, let's, what difference does it make? So what like you said, what this difference does it make? So we never cared about it too much. We said like whatever. Yeah. 
yeah. but there was a lot of pressure and then then Frank left the band because at that point we didn't get along me and him and uh, we became a trio um, it was even that bad that a part of the tour we did with Boloco I even didn't go on the road I stayed in the studio working on a soundtrack I did and um, and then at some point after the tour he left the band we became a trio and um, and then we made The Magnificent Tree in 99 yep. already yep and that yep. was kind of which is which is uh which is this album of course yeah yeah it's kind of it's kind of like you know that was kind of i have to say i have to thank annie rosebury for that she was like the international e r of sony music in london annie rosebury she was well i really liked her a lot and we started the album with a trio of a german engineer and two english djs and we made like three or four tracks you know spent quite some money on it and um and when it when it, when they were finished she listened to them and she said said to me like alex is this the way you want to go is this is what you want to do you know and I said, like, well, I'm not sure, actually. I don't think so, actually. She said, like, well, no, I don't think this is the way you should go anyway. So let's start all, start all over. You should do it yourself. And then I said, like, okay, maybe I should do it myself. Because like I said in the beginning, you know, I have this kind of way of doing things that is maybe not kind of very professional or whatever, but it has, it has a quirkiness that, that works, you know, like, and that kind of, like, works really well. And so... So I got in the studio with Roland Harrington again. We co-produced the record. He uh, mixed the first record, but now now he became, came in as a co-producer. And we spent seven week, weeks in the studio in Belgium, just like pre-production, like, you know, working on tracks and demos. And actually, Mad About You was a bass line, a beat, and a vocal line. The vocal line was recorded with a cheap microphone, like an SM58 or a Shure SM58. And we never changed it. That vocal line was the demo, and we 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 we, we felt it was kind of like magic. And he, it, it was Roland who said, like, yeah, you normally arrange the strings yourself, but maybe this time we should ask Matt Dunkley. He worked with Matt Dunkley because Matt Dunkley was the orchestrator for Craig Armstrong. And um, and I said, like, yeah, why not? Let's give it a go, you know. And so Matt Dunkley got the bass line, the beat, and the vocal, and he wrote like this the string arrangement. But back in the days, you couldn't program it. So I still remember going to a studio in London, Master Rock. It's it's no it no longer exists, but we got there, and that was the closest I got to listening to a Uberphonic song without any pre knowledge or something. You know, like the guys from from Pink Floyd say they would give millions. Just to be able to listen to Mark, a dark, uh, a dark Side of the Moon without having written it, without having produced it, without having even played it. Just kind of like like a virgin listening session of that record. And Mad About You for me was a bit like that because we were in the studio with the with the orchestra and the orchestra started to play that, that fantastic kind of arrangement. And we all had goosebumps. It was like, whoa, what is this? This is great, you know, like. And so, yeah, that was, it's a moment I will never forget. We were all three in the studio and that orchestra started playing and we didn't know what to expect, you know, because back in the days you couldn't, he wrote it really like, you know, he wrote a score, you know. And so there was no way to kind of, listen up front so also financially the risk you know we were doing something we were not even sure if we would like it you know and there was like a a 25 or 26 piece string orchestra in a, in a very expensive studio in london and we were like yeah whatever let's do it and if we don't like it we'll ditch it you know like that well, that's kind of the night that's that's the 90s you know like i said it's like it was crazy times but we did love it and we said like wow okay this is definitely something this is something special. And we felt mm -hmm. it immediately. And so, weirdly enough, when that song got released, it did nothing. It did nothing. It didn't go well on radio. And it just didn't work. And 
I think it took two or three months before it got used in a commercial uh, in Italy, and then in France, and then in another one, and then in another one. Then it got into an American movie, and and suddenly it kind of took off, you know, and it became really like popular. And it's quite funny because I the the lyrics are actually inspired on a real story. Um, the song was recorded in '99, but I wrote it, I think, in '98. And I was like in Devon in England in a castle with some other songwriters for a songwriting camp from EMI Publishing. And I never, I was young and they said, do you like to do that? I said like, yeah, why not? So I went there. And the first night we were in the castle in the cellar for a wine tasting because, you know, it, the guys who organized it thought it would be a great way to learn to know each other, you know, and see how the dynamics in the group were. And, and so there was this like, beautiful red hair and redhead you know like standing next to me and she tasted the wine she said like this wine tastes fishy and i said like there's nothing fishy about the wine it's great actually it's nice it has lovely tannins and it's it's well balanced i i don't don't understand so we started fighting all night we were fighting 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 and at the end of the night somebody said like do you even have a clue who she is i said like no i don't i know she's catty yeah, she's Kathy Dennis, man. She is like, you know, like she's a famous uh, singer here in England. I said, like, oh, okay, uh, well, in Belgium, we don't know her. I said, like, so, <laughs> so we were fighting the whole night. And then the next morning, we were, of course, you know, like I, we always wrote in groups of three people. And she was, of course, in front of my door, uh, knocking on the door. I said, like, oh, it's you, you know, like, and then we wrote the song, The Last Thing I Need Is You and Your Black and White Views Pushing Me Over. And and actually, that was the first song we wrote together. And by the end of that writing day, we were best friends. And so that's where the line comes from. Are you the fishy wine that will give me a headache in the morning? It's it's. I was in love with Kathy Dennis. You know? Yeah. Well, I was in love. And get, it was platonic, you know, but never no, nothing ever happened. But but I, it was platonic. I I had feelings for her, and so. She she drove in London in 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 in, a, in 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 the wrong way, of course, because for me London they drive on the wrong way. So the the uh, uh, driving in the wrong lane and everything in the the whole thing the whole song is talking about Kathy Dennis and about how I was how I was mad about you mad about you, but I was also also aware that it would never work, that it would never be something serious. So so and I. Quite often, you know, like like Eden was written for my first big love. You know, when I was seventeen, I was for six years with a girl, and it didn't work out. But Eden was really like saying goodbye to her, and so f quite often, if a song comes really from the heart, people kind of I don't know no notice it or feel it or you know like it's. So that's also probably why the the song did work so well because it's very genuine it's very real kind of the, the whole thing um, although it's quite funny to see that a lot of people get married and have mad about you as an opening dance while it's talking about an impossible relationship so i was always like yeah yeah but it's mad about you it's like yeah but are you <laughs> it's like feel the vibe feel the terror feel the pain it's driving me insane i'm not sure if you want to get married like that but yeah no, but no, you no, will no. you will you will get divorced you know <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. So, not only, so yeah. only that, not only that song, but you have vinegar and salt out of sight. Yeah, yeah. I, Jackie I mean, Kane, it's a lot um, of very good kids. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Even like you know, the opening uh, also harp is a great track. Uh, waves. We're playing waves these days again, and we're really? planning on on yeah, we're planning on doing like in two years. It's gonna be twenty five years old. The Magnificent yeah. Tree. So then we're gonna do like a couple of gigs with a big orchestra. We're gonna play the 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 the, the album. I think uh, in twenty five is is that's the plan. So uh, we're already playing a couple of more tracks. But although I have to say, we there's a couple of tracks like Jackie Kane never became like a, a radio hit, but but here in Belgium, it's one of the songs that I hear most on the radio. So sometimes it's kind of weird that to see that a song originally maybe wasn't that kind of that popular, but it became more popular by getting older or something. And when we play live as well, we always play Jackie Kane. We have Vinegar and Soul, Jackie Kane, Mad About You, that's Eden, uh, to Wiki, of course, that's tracks yeah. we will always play. Right, sure. Um, 
and Jackie Kane is like like you know for for our for our old time fans if you don't play Jackie Kane the gig is not not a gig not a good funny show you know like it it needs to kind of be there but it's it's kind of yeah it's it's kind of the, the interesting thing I think is when you're young you don't even have a clue what you're doing and because you don't have a clue what you're doing you're doing interesting stuff you know and when you're older you know what you're doing and that makes it kind of interesting in a different way i guess but it's like you know the kind of na naivety of of my of of me being 24 25 it's kind of like that kind of makes i think that's why a lot of artists make their best records when they're like around 27 or something it's kind of a very typical age where you're balancing between the two worlds i'm talking about now you're balancing between the naivety and spontaneity and at the same time you're starting to know what you're doing and like when you're pivoting on that kind of that that, that moment i think is that's quite crucial that's why i think uh, a lot of Absolutely. artists make great records uh, Absolutely they're... you you mentioned you know you mentioned five hits that you always want to play right even yeah. and to Wiki and Madaba you because they're they're popular they 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 all these want to listen but you have so many tracks how you you go from a hundred to fifty to twenty, and then the, the, in which the it's, flow, in which order do you play this stuff? It's uh, it's it's really yeah, it's a good question. That? It's a good question. It's kind of like um, well, first of all, of course, like we 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 have, I think we have like fifteen or sixteen songs we need to play. That's right. a lot. Yeah. Because you know, like in France, Bada Boom was a fan, was was a, was 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 very popular, and Anger Never Dies was a huge hit in Italy and in Belgium yeah. and in Holland and in France and in and then also in Eastern Europe, uh, Anger Never Dies was huge. Um, Amalfi did really well in Belgium and Holland. Um, um, so so there's a lot of songs. Romantic did really well in Italy again. So so there's like. I think 15 songs we have to play and then well let's say no let's say 13 we have to play and that leaves us with 10 songs we always do a couple of songs like now we're playing waves we're playing like uh, some new songs that are not out yet uh, that's for the first time in our career actually that we're playing songs that that were not released yet yeah. um we're uh and then we can always like you know play a couple of uh all-time favorites you know like we stranger from the president of the of the LED golf club we played for years we're now playing one way right the second track of uh of uh of blue wonder power milk so yeah. we always uh we did we did the uh, renaissance affair for a while so we always look for those songs a couple of songs that we really kind of that we want to play you know we, like m one of my favorite songs on the first record is someone and i'm already thinking about maybe s playing it again in 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 the fall we're gonna play a tour with a quartet again with a string quartet and then very acoustic and then someone was like also for me a very beautiful song so so we always play like you know like a mix of hits album tracks and new tracks that's always what we do and the, and the running order it's yeah it's kind of like you know taking your audience on a trip I think it's very important that the dynamics of the, the dynamic flow of a show needs to be kind of like it needs to take you from one part to another part and it kind of like I see it as a traveling through a landscape you know and you want to go from the sea to the mountains to the you know like and that's how I kind of my gut feeling tells me how to do it there's also a couple of songs that we quite often play in the same running order for years because they just kind of like whenever we don't do it it doesn't seem to work or something like um vinegar and salt and and, and jackie kane are quite often played together uh, because yeah. it's kind of like so but the cool thing is we're an eclectic band so we have like 